Hello students and welcome to part three of our nuclear lecture uh, series and this is the final one on nuclear waste and what do we do with it. So uh, it's a complicated topic like the rest of nuclear energy is. And let me advance to the next slide. So this is from your textbook and as far as the nuclear energy fuel cycle, um, we talked about the rest of this in the other parts of the lecture. What we want to focus on today is where do we put our waste. So once you're done with your nuclear fuel, and you decommission your reactor, you have both long-term needs and short-term needs for your nuclear waste. So um, the thing that's gonna need the long-term disposal, it's gonna be your really high radioactive waste. Other waste that has more short-term radiation, you can keep, uh, in, you can keep on site until it's not radioactive to be a, a worry anymore. So um, after your, your fuel rods are done, you've gotten all the fuel you can out of them, they're still highly radioactive, they're too hot to remove from the reactor, so you, you basically store them, or they're too hot to move anywhere. You basically store them on site for three to five years. Um, they're stored in water to keep them cool, so you don't get any more reactions going. All right, but as far as that long-term waste, um, if you look at those half-lives and how long it's gonna take for that uranium fuel to be safe again, you're looking at like tens of thousands of years. And so um, it's a really long, so we need a safe place to store this, this waste. All right, so it's a problem because would you want that nuclear waste stored on Mercer Island? Um, there's like 90,000 tons of it, and that was like data a few years ago, so that's more now. It's the ultimate NIMBY situation, which means not in my backyard. Nobody wants the nation's nuclear waste. All right, so short-term storage involves keeping, keeping the waste submerged in open pools of water for up to five years, and they need, eventually you need to seal that waste in, in, in casks. And, and hopefully transport it somewhere. Um, but right now it's not being transported anywhere because we don't actually have a, a, a facility, a waste site to put this. We'll be talking about that in this lecture. So instead you think about those 104 nuclear power plants. Some of them are still up, most of them are still operational. Some of them shut down. They are all still storing this nuclear waste at these 104 sites. If you think about California, a lot of those are near earthquake faults. And we have a couple here in Washington state also where we're in earthquake territory. So this is not an ideal situation to leave this waste at 104 locations all over the country. At the same time, you have to keep that waste secure meaning that there's people that might want to get their hands waste for terrorism type purposes. So, um, you know, if you leave it dispersed again, it leaves it vulnerable to terrorist attacks, accidents, natural disasters, etc. So the idea is that we need to dispose of it somewhere. So, you know, if you're going to keep it distributed, you're talking about 104 locations all over the country for that waste, and you're going to have to then have the ability to protect it and um, keep it, you know, under control that way. The idea is to set up a geologic repository, so a place to put that waste, and maybe all of the nation's waste could go to one location, and you would seal it, and you would protect it hugely, and being just one location, it should be easier to protect than trying to protect 104 locations all over the country. All right, so um, we've had um, storage sites before. There was the waste isolation pilot plant called WIP in New Mexico in 1999. Um, I never even knew this existed until a few years ago. They stored a bunch of waste 2,000 feet underground in a salt deposit. Um, it came to, kind of came to life in 2014, there was a leak. And it turns out they were using kitty litter to help, um, you know, like pack the waste and they used the wrong kind. They used um, organic kitty litter, not the inorganic kitty litter, and it set off a reaction that caused an explosion. $2 billion in damages and a shutdown of the facility for three years. This facility is a small facility. It was never meant to hold all of the nation's waste. For that, we, we chose a place called Yucca Mountain. Yucca Mountain is about 100 miles. Here's Las Vegas down there in the bottom corner of Nevada. So it's about 100 miles northwest of Las Vegas. And it's the site of the old Nevada test site where they set off bombs um, back in the 19, you know, 50s, et cetera, with, during the height of the Cold War. So this area, um, if you've, I've driven the road from here to here, there's big barbed wire fence. There's, you are not allowed to get off the road. They basically tell you to drive right through, no exits for non-military personnel. It's a highly controlled site. It's all been rather damaged by all of those nuclear bomb tests that they did for decades there. 
All right, so um, we at Why Yucca Mountain then? Partly because we did, we've already kind of contaminated the area because of those nuclear bomb sites. It's a government facility and it's a military site so that um, it's already a place that the government can use. We did look at two other sites, one of which was Hanford because talk about sites that we've already contaminated. Hanford's been pretty badly contaminated. And I'm not sure what the deal was with um, Def, Smith, Def Smith County, Texas, why that, that was one of the sites. But um, at the end of the day, due to lack of funding to fully like analyze which site would be best, they decided to go with um, Yucca Mountain. And there are some good reasons to Yucca Mountain. Um, this on the Ogallala Aquifer, which I mentioned during the fossil fuel unit with the Keystone Pipeline, you, if there was any kind of accident and that nuclear waste get, got out, you could contaminate the Ogallala um, Aquifer. And of course, the Hanford site is, sits right on the Columbia River. And again, if there were accidents, you could contaminate the Columbia River. So of the three, Yucca Mountain in an arid area and burying it deep underground, um, you wouldn't have those worries. But there were concerns. So Yucca Mountain, it's a thousand feet below the top of the mountain and a thousand feet above the groundwater. So kind of sits right in the middle of the mountain and it's because it's an arid area, the groundwater table is very low and they dug out this. So here's a picture of it right there. Um, this is basically you're gonna have rows upon rows. It's a huge underground cavern that they dug out. Um, and you can see the portal of it down there. All right, so this is a conception of you would actually bring things in via railroad tracks and you would truck this waste in from all over the country and store it at Yucca Mountain. They spent $10 billion building this national repository for a new waste and they got the money for that from the nuclear energy facility and, um, and had this built and were ready to use it. So what went wrong? Why are we not using this place? All right, so um, first, you know, a few other details about it was how are you gonna get all the waste to Yucca Mountain? And actually one of the concerns for people was that most of our nuclear power plants are on the East Coast. So why did we choose a place near the West Coast, out in the West, where we're gonna have to truck all this stuff across country, where by rail and in a few cases actually by sea, getting it to different ports and then trucking by train into Yucca Mountain, um, it would be very well on transport to an accident or to uh, nuclear terrorism, like somebody trying to steal it, et cetera. So, but right now that waste is in 43 different US states. All right, so this was just the transportation map and you can see that like here was one of the at sea areas, a few down in Florida, but this was, imagine transporting all that nuclear waste out to Yucca Mountain. All right, so here's Hanford and the, the site of the old Trojan nuclear power plant up where we are. All right, so the Department of Energy, um, in order to get it approved, they had to prove that people would never receive than 15 milligrams of radiation. And remember that average of 360 or 350 milligrams per year. So 15 would be very much. And they had to guarantee that you would get more than that. But you can imagine that the people of the state of Nevada were not too happy with this idea. So one of the, one of the complaints they made was that Nevada is a geologically active area. There's been volcanoes there in the last few million years. And there's kind of some debate whether that area would ever erupt again, but it is an area of active faulting and hot springs. And, um, and if you've ever been to Nevada, you get that, um, that topography there is from um, geologically active processes, which we don't need to go into here. So um, there was a lot of lawsuits. There was, I think, um, five or six. And basically Nevada tried their best to stop Yucca Mountain. And um, of all the lawsuits, there was one that actually held ground. And under their own dictates, they had said that the, um, they were going to have to keep it safe for as long as scientists said it needed to be kept safe. And scientists said it needed to be kept safe for, um, you know, for like 10, 100,000 years. And the government was like, we can't guarantee a place for 100,000 years. That's impossible. So the judge actually upheld that one and said, yeah, then you need to worry about that. So um, they would only guarantee it for 10,000 years, which to me even seems pretty long that the government could guarantee anything. Like... For, for that long. So, um, but you know, at the, at the end of the day, we were going to go forward with it anyway. And then there was the 2008 election and Obama really, really wanted to win the state of Nevada. So um, one of the things he did was um, he made a deal with Harry Reid, who was at the time the Senate Majority Leader, the Democratic Senate Majority Leader, and said, I will shut Yucca Mountain down. So true to his word, when he got elected in September 2009, he had the Department of Energy, the DOE, withdraw its application to have the facility licensed. And he did it in a way that they couldn't revive it later, which actually I'm not sure how that works, but that's what they did. 
Um, many states, all the states who are holding all this nuclear waste, including Washington, filed lawsuits. They're like, what? We paid billions of dollars into this fund to build this site, and now we're not going to use it? Um, and, you know, recycling waste can help. You can try to reduce the amount of waste, but at the end of the day, you have a whole lot of waste that needs to get stored somewhere. So, um, uh, energy utilities want their money back. They paid all this money into the fund, they want it back. And then Repub the Republicans were livid. They were really upset it's not moving forward. And one of them kind of joked that it's probably just going to end up as a big wine cellar. So we spent $10 million on a repository to put all this waste and we're not using it. So just a few more updates. In 2010, they suspended all work at Yucca. Um, by the end of 2015, um, we are now, it's increased by more than 50% since 2002. And um, uh, they're, now it's, they're now looking for a new site. And at the end of the day, Yucca may not have been the very best site to have chosen. Um, it's better than the other two they were looking at, the one in Texas on the Ogallala and the Hanford on the Columbia River. But really, I almost think they should have found a place in the Appalachian Mountains, very remote, again, very deep under the ground in the mountain. And the reason why I feel that way is because most of our nuclear waste is located east coast, west coast. Um, but the other thing the Obama administration did was they created a new national monument, the Basin and Range National Monument, and it was right on the major railroad track that was going to cart that stuff into Yucca Mountain. So it was one more nail in the coffin that would basically make it impossible to use Yucca Mountain. So um, in April 2019, a little bit more recent, um, one private company wants to build a storage site 35 miles from Carlsbad, Nevada, and, uh, sorry, New Mexico. Um, and hold the waste there till a permanent site is found. But you can imagine the town's not too happy about that one. So I don't know the current status there. So final topic, and nobody really wants to talk about this topic, but the idea of nuclear terrorism. And there's this idea that if um, terrorists could get their hands on nuclear material, they could make something called a dirty bomb. Making a nuclear bomb takes technology that most terrorists are just not gonna have. But a dirty bomb is where you just take radioactive material, pack it, regular bomb and explode it in a city and you could potentially contaminate very large areas. Um, other things that terrorists have looked at, the master planner of 9-11 um, looked at actually putting uh, a jumbo jet into a nuclear facility near New York, New York City and um, they have looked at this sort of idea of, of, of creating that. So you know more than one in three Americans lives within 50 miles of the 99 still active. Remember there were 104 and the waste is still at those 104, but now we're down to 99. So um, we have a lot of, of potentially dangerous locations that terrorists could target. So um, nuclear power plants have a ton of built-in state mechanisms, but they weren't designed. They were designed for accidents, um, things that would happen under normal operations. They weren't designed to withstand terrorist attacks. And just like the Twin Towers was never you know, no one ever imagined that somebody would fly an airplane into the Twin Towers. They were very strong buildings, but they weren't designed to take a jumbo jet flying into them. So similarly, nuclear power plants, if they did it right, you could cause a huge release of radioactivity that could contaminate American cities. So um, this is a concern. And um, so there's been a summit, you know, to discuss enhancing the security of radioactive material following the when this information came out that the terrorist groups were actually looking at um, and um, we have a lot of nuclear material stored in 24 different countries. 14 countries have given up their weapons usable plutonium and highly enriched. Other countries, including France, Russia, and the United States, have decreased their stockpiles, but there's still an awful lot of it out there. So, um, you know, since the end of the Cold War, both Russia and the, you know, the USSR slash Russia um, the, um, have reduced our nuclear stockpile. We still have quite a bit out there. Um, we have other countries, as you know, that are expanding their programs. So um, many countries have made their nuclear-related facilities more secure and have strengthened cooperation against nuclear smuggling, et cetera. But, you know, it's still something that we have to consider that if we're going to be refining uranium and putting it into a form that could be potentially usable for terrorist activities, we need to be thinking about this stuff. So um, nuclear detection equipment, things come into our ports all the time, someone could potentially smuggle in a dirty bomb that way too. So, you know, again, it's not anything that, um, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but it is, so we live in a world of terrorism these days. And so it's, it's something that um, we need to think about. But at the end of the day, what are the pros and cons of nuclear? There's some really strong pros. We have major reserves of uranium, um, lower mining impacts than coal, um, no, almost no carbon dioxide emissions. And that's probably the strongest pro that I can think of. No air pollution, acid forming emissions, no 
plant, you know, what you see coming out of a nuclear power plant stack is just steam. Um, and unlike a lot of our renewables, you can run a nuclear power plant like a coal plant. You can run it 24 seven so that you don't need to shut it down when the wind stops blowing or when the sun starts, stops shining. It can run all the time. That's another really pro of nuclear energy. But the are also pretty strong. They're expensive. Um, they're expensive, you know, and the, because you keep them maintained and uh, protected and all of those things we talked about, um, the cost to run them is high. Um, potential possible, possible catastrophic releases of radioactive contaminants, either through accidents or terrorism. Um, and then the waste issue, it's huge. Like, what are we going to do with all this stuff that we've made? Um, where are we going to store it? We're going to have to put it somewhere eventually. And ideas like blasting it into space are not okay because imagine one rocket full of nuclear waste blowing up when it launches and you would contaminate the world. So people always think blasting it into space is a good idea. It's a terrible idea. Um, we blow up rockets all the time. We're not, we're not perfect with our rocket technology and imagine one rocket blowing up, imagine the, like literally the fallout from that. So um, thermal pollution is another concern. Nuclear reactors run really hot and so you have to be careful before you return the water that you pull out of rivers to cool your, so that you cool it down before you put it back in the river. Um, and that is, I think the conclusion, this is from Miller, um, just so you can look at that on your own time. Um, and uh, Miller always has good trade-offs, advantages and disadvantages. Oh, and I wanted to mention nuclear fusion. So some people think that cold fusion would be a way to um, have it this inexhaustible energy source, and it would, it would be great. The idea behind fusion is that if we know how to fission atoms, like pull them apart, could we fusion them, put them back together? And then we could keep doing that and get this inexhaustible supply of energy. It's how stars run. Stars do fission and fusion all the time, but stars do it at tens of millions of degrees. So could we manage to do it at, when we say cold fusion, at a temperature that wouldn't melt down our laboratory? Um, and the answer is, I've, I've watched videos on this. I've kind of researched it a bit. We're kind of a long way from getting our technology like with this. And maybe there'll be some breakthroughs in, in my lifetime or your lifetime. But right now, cold fusion is not really something that we can do very easily. So I believe that is the end of our nuclear energy lecture. So I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and this is the last in the nuclear energy series.